I start here and I look at the anatomy and physiology as names, when I determine anatomy is the study of naming body parts. So that's your arm, that's your hand, that's your nose, that's your heart. We have to label all that. What muscle is this? That's body parts. And then physiology is the study of what? How it functions, right? How the stuff works. <coughs> so that would be like here. How the body parts function together. So right here, uh, anatomy is the study of structure. Physiology is the study of function, how it works. What's interesting is the stuff that structure dictates function. So the question that came up, there's a concept question. Uh, the way that something is shaped determines what it can do. A heart is the body's pump because it is made, it's a, it's a muscle which surrounds a chamber filled with blood that when it is squeezed, it pumps the blood out of that chamber into the attached pipes. Can you explain a concept of uh, structure dictates function and have an example in your own words? Anybody feel like they got that? That's very good, yeah, lungs, you know, the way that the tissue in the lung is when you touch in the canary, you touch the lung tissue, it's very spongy. It's like you could, we actually have a, 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 a lung attached with the trachea where you, you know, you can inflate it and it gets, it gets bigger really fast. And so that, yeah, that hello chamber is made for that. If this tissue inside here would be solid, you couldn't fill it up with air. And often we have, when we talk today about the different chambers, the, the, the chest area, the thoracic cavity, compared to the pelvic, abdominal pelvic cavity, this is more airy, this is more fluid stuff. That's why when you do, when you, have you heard of core exercises? The core is basically squeezing this stuff together like it's solid then, and then this whole trunk is solid. It's not as much up here, it's down here where it's liquid. This is airy, so yeah, we can fill it up with air. So that's a very good example. Does that make sense? You know, that's why when you ask the question and, and go through the stuff, you ask, you know, you, why is a wheel round and not square? Well, it would be kind of hard to drive if it's square. We pretty, sh you know, that's the question stuff you ask when you look at that. You want to have the, this is a topic, you want to have that why question that the kids ask, you know. Don't ask it until you get the answer you want. You just ask it to understand why is why is it hard having four chambers? You know, it's it, we're gonna explain. Well, pumps the blood to the lungs to fill up with oxygen, and then another part pumps the blood to the gut and the rest of the body to bring it oxygen. And oxygen, you know about oxygen, right? In the body, we need oxygen. That's the stuff we breathe, and we need oxygen to make energy. And energy in the body will learn next topic uh, to Monday, probably next Monday, is, is ATP. It's an energy molecule and we need the oxygen to put that energy molecule together and then we can use that energy molecule all in the body to do work, like contract the muscle, something that creates energy, uh, that needs energy. So that's where we need oxygen, so that's very interesting. Anybody else have an example of that? Or thinking about that? Structure dictates function? No? Good. Well, let's move on to the next um, thing here. When we look at, oh, unexpected error was, but when we look at a person, we see an entire organism. To understand this entirety, we break it down into smaller parts, all the way to the chemical level of atoms. We'll talk about atoms on Wednesday. Can you pick the list of all the levels from small to large? This one? No. One more down? Yeah, that's about right, huh? The smallest the atoms, then we put a whole bunch of atoms together, we have molecules in there also. Like water is a molecule, hydrogen is an atom. Uh, and then the cells is an X. That's like everything, when it comes to a cell, we call it it's a living thing. Cells are independent living units. They can survive on planet Earth. Probably somewhere else too, but definitely. Um, 
And then we are made out of a lot, a lot, a lot of cells, like trillions of cells. Um, and tissues are sort of an in-between between the cells and us. They are like different types of structures. Like all the muscles, we can describe as muscle or tissue because they're all kind of looking the same way. The same with nerves, nervous tissue. And then we got a couple more. We'll talk about those before we do the test in a few weeks. And then a bunch of tissues together make an organ, like a heart. Like a heart has, part of the heart is muscle. That's a tissue type. Another part is nerve because it's got to know when to pump. That's a tissue type. So then you create organs. And then you have organs coming together, and that's organ systems. Like the heart with the pipes attached to all the blood vessels, that's an organ system. The heart alone is an organ. The blood vessel alone is an organ as well. And then we have all these organ systems together, and that's the organism. That's not only here. But that's then us as a whole unit. Ta-da. There you go. That's out of the book. That, if you take, anybody going to do 20 AB after this class? Yeah? No? Buy a two? Yeah. yeah. So 20 AB uses the book of, most of them use a book called by, uh, Anatomy and Physiology by Elaine Marriott. Some of the pictures are out of that book. That I, I like that book. It's just it's too big for us in class, too much detail. And then some, you had the book, The Essentials, is from also that, and then that's not enough, I feel. So I just did my own thing with it. All right, let's go to the next thing here. Vitamin D, oh yeah, good old vitamin D. Is made when sunlight hits and interacts with the skin. That is why it's good to go out for a walk when there's sun. Or even there's no sun, there's still sun when it's daytime. Uh, we can take vitamin D supplements, which a lot of us should be taking, and a lot of recommendations go into taking that, especially if like fibromyalgia is associated with vitamin D deficiency. Uh, actually cancers, a bunch of cancers too. So it's interesting to test the level uh, uh, when you do blood tests, so vitamin D level, because it's easy to supplement, but still the best way to get it is not supplementation, it's direct sunlight. So this is the reason why we should go to the sun. Uh, vitamin D keeps us healthy in many ways. If we don't get enough sunlight, our body can't make it. Many of us are deficient. Going out for a walk, taking a supplement can help. I just said that. Hmm. What else does the integumentary system support us? Choose all correct answers. All right. Does the, integ the integumentary system is your skin, right? Does that help with sweat? Body sweat? Yeah, right? That's out from the skin, that thing. Uh, skin as an external covering is an excellent boundary surrounding the body. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes sense, yeah. It protects the deeper tissue from injury? Yeah. Perfect. You know, you can bang into things, you don't bleed. Have you ever thought that was a miracle? <laughs> you know, there's like a skin layer of cells. There's a lot of, the skin is like a lot of cells and when you bang into something, the top layer just falls off and more are made. If you cut too deep, then you bleed. But then that tells us something else. We'll talk about the skin later on in the class. Um, and then it harbors sensory receptors that inform the brain of pain or pressure sensations. Would that make sense? Yeah. yeah so they're all right. The skin is a very interesting organ. It's a very interesting organ. So we go through all these things here. Let's see what's the next the bone. Okay, let's see. The skin is here. So you learned that. And then the bones are next. Let's look at the question for that. Bone is hard and solid like concrete. It holds us up against gravity, muscle attached to them, and when they contract, they move us around. That makes sense, right? They are attached, you know, you've got the knee joint, you've got a lower leg muscle, upper leg muscle, muscles here crossing it. If they contract, this bends. If they contract, it straightens out. So we learn a bunch about these muscles. That's my favorite topic. You'll be all sick and tired of me muscle talking. Um, and this hard material also protects softer tissue. Like the brain has a skull around it, the lungs have ribs around it, that's protection. It uh, has two more distinct functions that seem unrelated but make sense once we talk about it in class. What are they? Secreting hormones? No. No. 
making blood cells yeah. and storing calcium. There you go. Those, that's the one. So calcium and blood cells. Very interesting. You know, the, the bones store calcium because the body needs calcium for a lot of functions, like nerve impulse. That's pretty important. Or muscle contraction. That's also important. And so it has this huge reservoir that it can pull calcium from where we need it. So we don't always have to eat the kale or the broccoli. Because sometimes we don't feel like eating kale or broccoli. But if we never eat kale or broccoli, guess what? We're not going to have that much calcium in our system. And the body will need and use it, and it uses it up faster. And then when we get old, we have brittle bones. Because they're not held together with the calcium. And that's called osteoporosis. So that's, that's one thing where it's interesting to know. Calcium and the bone stuff go together. All right, let's see what's next. Muscle. Muscles contract pulling the ends of bones closer, end points closer. Choose all the correct examples how the body makes use of that function. So muscle, all muscle does is contract, short. That's an active function. It can get longer, but that's passive. It just happens to it. It doesn't do it automatically. Contra I mean, act actively. Contracting is actively. So what else does that function do? Does it produce heat? Yeah. yeah. When you run around, you get hot. That's, that's a byproduct. A lot of times, um, um, heat is a byproduct when you change the form of energy, like you change, you know, you take the oxygen, you make energy molecules, and then the energy molecules go to the muscle to contract the muscle. So you change the form of energy from a chemical, the molecule, to a physical, the contraction. That transformation often has heat as a byproduct. That's like the light bulb, it gets warm. It's a byproduct. And in the body, we can use that. When you're cold, you go to jumping jacks, you get warm. That's good. Or you start shivering. Uh, it helps us move around. Yeah. Helps us hear. No. Helps the body sweat. No, no we just have that in the integumentary system. Maintains posture. Yeah. Yes, good. You got that. I guess we can. This is the test if we need to do all the chapters, or you just got it anyway. So you got it in here the skeletal system, the descriptions, and then the muscles are here. And then afterwards, we get to the nerves. Let's see, there's a question on the nerves, too. So the first few chapters is multiple choice and true-false. Later, we have to write it in. So there's fill in the blanks. So it gets a little bit more. So if these are too easy, you let me know. I can change them into fill in the blanks earlier on in the semester. Um, nerves is next. They're like wires that physically connect every part of your body with the brain. So every cell is connected with a cable that goes through the body into the spinal cord up into the brain and then in the brain it goes to a specific place. And it's a literal cable like an te old telephone cable, not the cell phone stuff, the old stuff. And so when you send a signal, the electricity travels from the beginning point of that nerve to the end point of that nerve and then it does something at the end point. It usually talks to a nerve to say, hey, we got poked, you got to do something about that. Or it talks to a muscle because it can just do something about that. Or it talks to a gland. And often that's, you know, you, you notice that when people get anxious, because when a, when a brain gets anxious, a nerve needs to talk to, there's a thing up here, got to go somewhere, that thing, that energy. So a nerve can either talk to another nerve, so they get anxious, and we start having racing thoughts, get obsessive, all that kind of weird stuff. We have to work against it a little bit. Or we can start, you see these people, they use the fidget spinners, or they start talking, the tongue is a muscle, or they start running around, they have to walk and do marathon running and all kind of stuff to calm down that anxiety. Or some people, they start sweating and it stinks. That's the plan. And so, you know, I, I, it's, it's it's, it happened to me once when I was working and I had a patient and she had an injury and it was a hip and, and I had to do a dis, dis, hip distraction move and it's like, and I was like, you know, no, it was, you know, I had to do it, but I had to be very in tune with what's going on to feel exactly which motion and then yank on it a little bit.
to loosen up some adhesions that got created. She was doing uh, air, out of airplane jumping kind of stuff. Um, and, and it was really intense for me, and she got help. But I started sweating, I'm like, and I started stinking. I'm like, oh God, what's wrong with me? And, I, and, I, and then an hour later, everything was fine. It's like the anxiety it just had to, the body had to release it somehow. And so it's, it's good to know those things and start thinking about how this stuff works without knowing all the technical terms and all that. Because ultimately, when you want to go to the doctor and you have to figure out, you know, what does this mean? That's where the explanations come from, not the difficult words. And if the doctor uses difficult words, you tell them to slow it down, or her. And if they don't, you say, you know, please. And if they still don't, then you know, mm, they're either in a rush or something's going on. But you gotta question things then. All right, anyway, so the nerves, they connect everything with the brain. And then the brain coordinates every body function via electrical signals telling all these cells and things what to do. Uh, does the brain send? Oh, the, the, does the brain send electrical signals slow or fast? Fast. So electricity goes very fast. It also goes away very fast. So I think the next question then is: the glands secrete chemicals, and then they also coordinate body functions, but they go via the bloodstream. So they're like the bloodstream goes through the body anyway. The oxygen needs to go through and the hor and the. Uh, food stuff, the glucose and all that. And then there is these glands like the thyroid gland, or we got a few in the head, in the brain, and they dribble different hormones into the bloodstream and then it travels through the body and at some point, a cell, you all know the insulin thing, right? Diabetes stuff, you all know about diabetes, right? So the body makes insulin to get the sugar from the bloodstream into the cells. So the pancreas will secrete the insulin perps perps into the bloodstream and the bloodstream, the, the insulin then travels through the bloodstream and wherever there is a cell that has a receptor, a physical thing that is like, oh, that's shaped like an insulin. The, it's the key of the lock thing. It's a lock for the key of insulin. Then that insulin hooks on to that lock and the cell changes the shape and it opens a gate and glucose can go into the cell. That's how that works. And every hormone thing works that way, fundamentally. So the gland will squirt the hormone into the bloodstream and the bloodstream will travel around the body and when there is a cell with an appropriate receptor, a, a lock, the key goes in and the hormone does a function. No, the hormone actually just tends to cell, tells the cell to do something. It does not do the function itself. The cell does the function. It's a messenger, so to speak. You heard of that thing, don't kill the messenger, right? Yeah. We get pissed at the messenger, but we can't kill it. So, knowing that, do you think the glands, the hormones, work on a, a process, is a process that goes slow or fast? Slow, in comparison to the nerves. And you notice that when you drive down the freeway and you got some stupid jerk that cut you off and you almost have an accident. Oh, I know, take five more minutes. Or don't do whatever, don't watch TV in the car. Um, but, but you know, you swerve out of the way, so you don't have an accident, right? That's the nerve doing it. You don't even think about it, it just happens. That's how fast the nerves travel. And then you're like sitting there and you're driving, you're like, oh my God, that was horrible. A half minute later you feel like, I didn't have any coffee, why do I feel like I had so much coffee? You get all jittery. And the jittery feeling is the hormones, the adrenaline that goes through the bloodstream and goes to the cells and make you feel that jittery. So that lag time, you can feel that. If that's an event, we can feel that lag time, how much slower the hormones are and the nerves are. So that's, I mean, not that we want to have those moments, but it happens. Uh, keep alert, be fast. So those are these two systems. And then the next system we're gonna talk about is the blood, the cardiovascular system. Do these things make sense? Good. Tell me if I'm boring you. I know, you can't even say that. Huh? Blood is a great medium to carry chemicals through, the pi through pipes, which are blood vessels, and deliver them to all over the body. What organ pumps, oh, that's the same one, pumps the blood around in the body? Heart. The heart. The <laughs> heart. Welcome to the, you know, that's interesting though. You know, everybody, they say, you know, you're thinking in the brain and you're feeling in the head and in the brain, all that. But I remember this patient coming, she's a neuroscientist, and now she's an IT person. 
a very interesting lady, and I worked with her for a long, long, about 15 years probably. And she had to get a pacemaker. Her heart was having an issue. And she got a pacemaker, and her energy level was just like this. And she was active, she has a sailboat, she's like, you know, I'm like, what did you do last weekend? And the list is way too long for me. And all of a sudden, that, that wouldn't be the case anymore. And then, and then she about, she had to go back to the cardio, and at some point she came in and said like, they tuned my heart. I'm like, what? They hooked it up to a computer and fine tuned all the little whatever things they fine tuned, and I'm energetic and I'm all good. Now, I was like, wow, that's, that's, and she's like, you know, I really realized the soul, all that deep thing, it's in the heart, it's not in the head. My heart is off, the whole thing is off. And so it was like an interesting food for thought. So the heart, you know, we, in the literature and places, we, we give it that energy, that, that, that feeling energy. But there is something that's real about that. And you know when people have heart transplants, they often say, like, the energy of the person the transplant is from comes with the... the they often take on personality traits from the person that the heart is from. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting organ from that perspective, too. And it's very electrical, you know, it's got its own electricity. If you take a heart out of a person, it, it still pumps on its own. Until it has no more energy, then it goes and stops pumping. But it has its own electricity circuit um, on the heart. The same with the gut. We talk more about the one in the heart because we understand it more um, than the one with the gut. All right, let's see. The cardiovascular system is not fully efficient in keeping all the liquid in its pipes. The lymphatic system picks up fluid and returns it back to the... Uh, uh, the blood near the heart. How else does the lymphatic system help us? It what? That one? Good, true, good, perfect. So when you think of the heart pumps and the blood goes away from the heart, like it's hydrostatic pressure, it's like you open the, the pipe, you know, you, you turn on the faucet, it's that kind of pressure. But then the blood needs to seep into the tissues, into all those muscles. You know, muscle is, is red, the meat, right? And, and how does it get back to the heart? So that's really difficult because you don't have all these other hearts down there that pump it back up to the heart. You have to have different ways. And so that's where the, uh, the, the veins come, come into play. Have you heard of arteries and veins? Probably, right? The veins come into play. So a lot of the fluid gets back pulled into the veins and then it goes to the heart because the veins travel through muscles and when the muscles contract, that squeezes it up. Have you heard of varicose veins? These blue things in the legs, you know, people? I know, I'm getting one of them. And um, th th those veins have valves that go up and when, the, when, when the, then the, the muscle pumps where they go through, it pushes the blood upward, but it can't go back down because of the valves hold it up. But sometimes when we get older, those valves leak and that's the varicose veins. And so it pools. Um, and, and so that's, it's interesting how, how the blood comes back. And, but it's still, the veins is not, the venous system is not as efficient as, and, and it has a lot of leakage going on, and then the lymphatic system are these little end uh, finger sort of structures, these pipes that have, our dead ends pipes, and the fluid from around can come into these lymphatic lymph vessels, and then the lymph vessels travel towards the heart and dump it in, dump the lymph, they call that lymph, dump it into the heart area and into the blood vessel, and then it's part of the blood again. But the lymph nodes, so that lymph travels through these nodes. Often when you get sick, you feel them here. They hurt when they blow up because a lot of immune cells sit in those lymph nodes. And when we get a, a, a virus or a, a bacteria, it, 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 they read it and the lymph picks it up and then the lymph nodes get fully engorged with white blood cells so the system can fight the infection as, as much as possible, as vigorously as possible. And so that's where that comes back in, the immune system. The negative of the lymph node stuff and all that systems of fluid going through, it can spread cancer. And that's where we, when we look at cancer, it's like, did it spread or not? We look at lymph nodes. And then often we take out lymph nodes. So often you see that the, with breast cancer, you remove the breast tissue, but first you also remove the lymph nodes, especially the axilla. And then a lot of times with these people, then they need sleeves to have compression stockings on their, uh, their arms because the lymph doesn't drain the arm anymore. And so it becomes puffy. It's not efficient anymore. 
And so that's that's a way that's a place where you can understand how much the lymphatic system does in terms of draining the fluid out of the tissues. Then it doesn't work anymore, and you, or you don't have to take it out. Like my brother, like he had this, his inguinal lymph nodes out because he had some cancer, and his legs stopped blowing up, and nobody told him anything about it. And my sister, she's like, oh my God, what's going on with him now? He's got another whole disease going on. But it was only the lymph were there anymore, so you had to do, what do you do then? You go back and think, what is the venous system help with? So you, you can do that muscle contraction. So you go walking or you do a bike, a sitting bike, so you don't have the gravity pushing all down, and you drain it more that way, or you have these compression sleeves, so the, push, the fluid gets pushed up into the, uh, 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 the whole, the rest of the body that way. So anyway, that's the lymphatic system. Probably too much information for now, but that makes some sense how that works? Good. Our body needs molecules in the form of gases from the environment, survive, oxygen is needed in order to make ATP. That's that energy molecule that I talked about. Where in the lungs does the gas exchange occur? The second one? The second one? Alveoli. Yeah, that's a hard word, huh? In the alveoli. That's the little air sacs in the, in the lungs. So that back to the tissue feeling, right? Those, the little, like, grapes on the stem, they're all airy things. So when you squeeze them, they just collapse. They're not solid on the inside. Because the air needs to be able to come in, and then across those, those grape-looking uh, 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 bubbly things, they have a membrane, and the gas goes through the membrane into the bloodstream. It just goes right through it. It's a, a diffusion, they call that. We'll talk about diffusion. Food is how we nurture our bodies with particles that give us energy and keep us functioning healthily. I hope that's the right English word. Breaking big chunks of food down into small enough pieces that the body can absorb them requires that we chew and churn the food physically, as well as squirt a bunch of chemicals onto it, helping it to digest further. Physical chewing, physically chewing your food is where you consciously affect this process. Next time you eat a savory sandwich, such as cheese or meat sandwich, chew it 30 times. Then ask yourself, does the savory turn sweet or not? True or false? True. Isn't that interesting? I know, I'm sure your mom told you to chew the food. So what happens when you chew it in a mouse that long, you have chemicals that get squirted on by your spit. The saliva has chemicals in it. They call them amulase. We'll talk about those words later. But those chemicals break down carbohydrates. And your, your sandwich, the bread, is carbohydrate. And so you can have a sandwich that's salty stuff, and you chew it enough, the sugar gets released. And so that's when you know you chewed it enough. Then you can swallow it, ideally. You know, if you only have one piece for a whole day, you'll be chewing that piece as long as you can. But we're having a little more saturation going on in our wonderful world. So that's, tr that's true, huh? Turn sweet, yes. The kidneys filter your blood and make pee. Yep, how does that keep us healthy? Pick all that apply. Eliminate nitrogenous waste, yes, no. Good. Regulate body temperature? No. That would be your skin and just shivering and all that stuff, that's the skin. Uh, Help, actually, you could, that could be muscle tissue too. If that were in the muscle tissue, you probably would have to give it because you can do jumping jacks and stay warm that way. But definitely not the kidneys. They can't do this stuff and help you with that. But it helped uh, maintain the pH balance, yes or no? Yes. Yes. That's very important. We'll talk about that um, soon. Eliminate carbon dioxide from the body, yes or no? No. No. Who does that? Lungs. The lungs. Regulate water? Yes. 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 Yeah, did you ever notice when you drink coffee, you gotta go freaking pee all the time? Mm -hmm. Same with beer or other alcohol. And that's the because that the reason for that is there is a hormone called the antidiuretic hormone. Diuresis means you know peeing, um, so that making the blood thin. Uh, uh, antidiuretic, so anti pee hormone. So if that's present, we don't go pee all the time. If we drink caffeinated stuff or alcohol, that hormone is not present. You always have to go pee. So that's partly then 
you know, we dehydrate on the inside. That's why we want to drink a lot of water when we drink coffee or drink alcohol because of that. So we don't just pee it out, but we'll bring it back in. Hmm. Another place where you can learn what a hormone does is when you eliminate it and then you see what it doesn't do. The main purpose of the reproductive system is have fun. No, it's the production of offspring. It's true or false? <laughs> good, good. Well, I'm going to keep some of you, right? <coughs> And then we'll talk, we have a chapter on that. We hardly ever get to it. It's far, far away from us. But we have a date for it, I think. So maybe this time we get to it. We end up having often a pathology uh, project presentation during that class, which is actually more fun, I think. All right, these are the systems. We got through them. No biggie. Oh, now we get to the necessary life function. That was a concept question. In order to keep us alive, our body needs certain overarching functions. For example, boundaries keep us distinct from our environment. This way we can keep our internal or out, internal or inside within specific parameters. So that, like body temperature. You know, you wanna have an inside body temperature that's the same, not like the outside, it's changing all the time. You, you, need, you need to have a boundary around you to be able to have that inside parameter be different than the outside parameter. Maybe not the best example, but it works. Uh, just think of, oh look, I did that right there. Since uh, we need to eat, we need to move and manipulate the world around us, which is movement, to get food you know, from a tree so we can eat it, for example, or on the fork of the mouth. Food needs to then be broken down, which is digestion, so that the body can absorb the small chemicals that make energy out of them, which is metabolism. Making energy, actually any chemical reaction inside your body is, is overarchingly named as metabolism, as a word. And so um, making energy out of food is part of metabolism. So that's a function. If you don't have that function, you're not gonna live. You gotta be able to make energy. If we don't have a skin, a boundary, all the, everything, the, all the, Coronavirus, these things, they all go in anyway. There's no boundary. And so boundary is important, movement is important, digestion is important because you cannot make energy out of an apple. You've got to break it down. So it's little small things and then you can make energy. Um, and then the metabolism we said is the energy making thing. What other four body functions are necessary to sustain life? List them and explain why they were important. Anybody have an idea? No, wait, uh, let me go look then. If I have to do it. Yeah? Good, perfect. So those are the other things we need. So we have a list of the other. Boundaries, movement, responsiveness. So that means we have to react to something. Digestion we have there. Metabolism, we do excretion, you gotta poop the stuff out you don't need, otherwise you get toxic. There's this joke, you know, which organ is the most important organ? Everybody says, me, 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 but at the end you get the, the asshole says, if I don't let anything go, it's gonna be toxic in there. <laughs> and then growth. And yeah, if you, you know, you gotta grow. If you come out of the womb and you never grow, how am you gonna have another baby? It's gonna get small, it's like a Russian doll thing. It's not gonna work, so we have to be able to grow. All right, so that's the necessary life functions. And then we have things we need to survive. So those are survival needs. But of course, this works out, but there's more fundamental things, like you need, you need food, for example. So besides love and emotional nurturing, our bodies have a few fundamental things we need to survive. Temperature needs to be within a narrow range. The atmospheric pressure around us uh, also has to be in a certain way. What are the two things do we absolutely need to survive and why do we need them? Anybody? From this kind of the, no? Come on guys. So we need nutrients, oxygen, that's not on the list, that's one of them, right? Oxygen, and why do we need oxygen? To what? While we breathe the oxygen, 
and inside the body, they call that external respiration. They're getting the oxygen into the body. And then from the blood, when it's in the body, it's in the blood, from there it goes into the tissues and the cells. They call that internal respiration because in the cell then is where we make energy. So then the oxygen, <clears throat> the oxygen helps making energy. So everything has a few overarching things. Energy you need in the body to, to live, otherwise never mind. <clears throat> so oxygen is needed to make this energy. And then we have the body temperature and the atmospheric pressure. What else was there? I think that's it, right? That's it. Good. Then we get to this other thing. Let's talk about this thing. We go back to this. It is crucial for our bodies. Oh, look, I have a fill in the blank. It's crucial for our body's internal environment to be stable. That goes for body temperature, but also for blood calcium level, blood glucose level, oxygen level, acidity, and much more stuff. So we all these, we have like these cells that measure the chemicals inside the body, and then when it's a little bit off, it does something to balance it out. Like the glucose level is too high in the bloodstream, that's not good, that makes blood sticky. Sticky blood and stuck in pipes, that makes us sick. That's not good, that's diabetes. So when that measuring comes in, oh, that glucose level is high, then the pancreas gets alert and says like squirt some insulin in, and then the blood glucose level decreases and goes down and is back in an error range. Now, what is that called? When the body is stable, it is in what? Homeostasis. So homeo means the same, and stasis means standing still. So that means the inside environment is in balance. And it's just when you forget that, you think of body temperature, and you ask, why the heck is mine always the same, but outside it's cold or hot? That's homeostasis. And the body wants to be in homeostasis. And so what else comes out of that, in order to maintain the stability, the body is constantly balancing things out. It gets too warm, if it gets too warm, it cools itself down. For example, with, um, <clears throat> for example, we do the sweat. It cools us down with sweat. For, uh, if the body is the opposite, when it gets too, uh, when it gets too warm, we cool it down with sweat. It gets too cold, we heat it up with shivering or with movement. So we always do the, sec the opposite one. So we're in, in balance, we wanna bring it back to balance. That's why we call it the negative feedback loop. So it's not it's bad, negative is not bad, it just it balances out. The thermostat balances out to 70 degrees. Uh, what are the components of the homeostatic control system? Can you list them? Anybody? From the center somewhere. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. Perfect. Isn't there another word for the control center though? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there is? Is, is there? A well, brain. Okay, there you go. Or it could be the spinal cord for rudimentary stuff, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have to, the, the receptor, so the first, of course, we have a stimulus, the, the receptor picks up the stimulus. And then it has to bring it in. So the input is part of that. So if you elaborate a little bit more, that's also good. And so the receptor picks it up, it sends the impulse to the control center. We consider that the brain. The brain says, blah, 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 what do we need to do? Ah, we need to do that. And then it sends a, a pathway out to an effector, and the effector does whatever it needs to be done to bring it back in balance. So like from outside in, basically, and then? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, right, right, so it could be like, it could be like, you know, simply like you turn a light on and it's bright. It's like, whoa, that's bright. Whoa, that's bright. And the brain's like, what the heck can I do? I'm going to brighten up here. It can close the pupil then. Right? It can send an effector, a, 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 a pathway to the effector and close the pupil down so not as much light comes in. And it balances out. Oh, I'm not having a headache now. That's good. And so, yeah, you have that stimuli that can come from the outside has an effect on the body, and the body has a response to it. And that negative feedback loop is that the response is balancing out. The imbalance gets created, and we have to balance it out. Also, we, 
The external thing can also be an internal thing, like how much calcium does my blood have? It's an imbalance inside. So that can also be the case. You still you have a receptor that picks up that change in the bloodstream, or the glucose, what we just did, right? And then you have the brain says, what the heck are you gonna do with that calcium? It's not high enough. Well, let's go to the bone and chip some off and put it in the bloodstream so we have a high enough again. That will be the effect of it. So the other thing we talk about here, and the effector that has the effect that the bone goes into the blood and we get more calcium going on. Uh, the other thing we want to have besides receptor control and effector is the afferent pathway and the efferent pathway. So these are the cables or the pathways that go bring the information into the brain for processing and then bring the information out of the brain to the effector for the effect. And so afferent is always when the information goes up into the brain. Efferent is when it goes out to the body, neurologically speaking. <clears throat> I remember that. I always have to have mnemonics. Mnemonics are great. The, ver the horrible they are sound, the better they are. The more they stick around. So, or the stupider they seem. So the one here, for me, afferent goes up. Ascending starts with an A2. Right? Efferent is like exit. So it's with an E. It exits the brain. That's how I remember those terms. And as long as I have that bridge for a while, then at some point it becomes natural. It's just part of my vocabulary. I learned English through doing anatomy stuff in Kanbasar school. So it's very funny when you learn a language with that like that. Um, do, you, do you understand that? Negative feedback loop thing? Okay, good. Then let's go forward and go back to the quizzy because we have a positive feedback also. We have a positive feedback loop where <clears throat> the initial stimulus becomes stronger and more intensified. Most of the time, this is not helpful for the body and is associated with disease processes. Disease processes, the word for that is pathology. There are, however, a few normal body processes, which is not disease processes, that are explained by the positive feedback loop. Pick the right one from the list. Blood clot. So when you have a cut in a blood vessel, which is kind of a problem, you have to create a process where you start patching the blood vessel up. And you have fibers that solidify out of the liquid and patch up the blood vessel where it's broken. And that process needs to get intensified more and more done until the blood vessel is patched up. And once the blood vessel is patched up, it's got to stop. If it keeps going, it's a problem because you're going to clock that whole damn blood vessel up and you can't get blood through it anymore. And so that's like a, a, a moment. The other better, the better example, I think, I just didn't put it in as an example here, is the birth childbirth. So when you have the, the baby needs to come out. So you've got contractions. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until the baby comes out and then they have to go away. But if they just immediately go like, oh, it's a cramp, well, let's balance it out and let's stop having the contraction, balance out. That wouldn't work with having the baby come out. But in most body things, it, this doesn't help. In most body processes, that becomes a problem. We have a few, the, the baby, the milk letdown process and then the blood clotting. Those are probably the biggest examples we have for physiological processes in a positive feedback loop but not pathological processes. I know these words, huh? All right, so that wasn't too hard to get through. Then let's get to the second part of this uh, lecture here. Anatomy has to do with giving names to body parts. In order to reference body areas properly, we describe everything in the anatomical position. What is the anatomical position? Palm four. And the reason why we have that be the case is, let me bring Johnny over here. Hello. Oh. Hello. We got to have a lot of times together. So when you look at this skeleton here, it's plastic too, by the way. Um, when you have the palms forward, 
There is two forearm bones and they are parallel. If we have the palms backwards, they're crossing over each other. Do it for me, thank you. And so we have to, if we do this. So if we, an anatomical position is a position that anything needs to be, that anything will be described in. So even if you're like this, the thumb is still, la is still hanging on the outside of the nose when I describe something. It's not my thumb, it's not behind my neck. Because otherwise we couldn't understand how to describe things. So in relative terms of what's happening in the body were, we always reference the anatomical position to describe things in. And that's why when the palm is forward, it's easier to describe things when they're parallel than when they're crossed over like that. That's why the anatomical position is a palm forward standing up straight. That makes sense? Good. Bye bye. We'll bring you back later. Good. And of course, since the entire world has to communicate and use the same terms, the language they are in is either in ancient Greek or Latin. Regional terms start exposing you to this language. Some of them you recognize as we use them in more common languages, such as oral for mouth, like an oral fixation somebody has, uh, or abdominal for stomach. But what does pedal mean? What does sternal mean? Foot and breastbone. There you go, good. So these you have to study. What? Yeah. So I want you, and I have a, we have a lab where you label stuff. I want you to, for sure, at home or in the class, talk about it. Go through those terms, and at you know at least first what you do is you figure out which one do I already know. Then you don't worry about studying that too much. You just have to make sure you don't confuse it later on. So when you're sure it's that, but like oral, a lot of us know oral is mouth. But no nasal is nose, that's cool, we can handle that. But then, you know, there's a few like uh, orbital, eye, that can be a little harder, but you, so you go through these a few times and you, you, you study them. Any of them don't make sense? Did you look through them already? The chromial is tip of the shoulder, deltoid is the arm here on the side, brachial is where the biceps brachial is. A lot of these terms, like, like brachial, if you know that term brachial, you got muscles up the bazoo that have the word brachial in it. You got corticobrachialis, biceps brachial, brachialis, brachioradialis, triceps brachii. So you got five right there, and they're all in the upper arm. You see that word somewhere, you know they're all in the upper arm. So that's your, you know, and so the more you know this fundamental stuff, the easier all the other things become. So spend a little time on that, and there's the back. Um, and then we're all cool with it. Then the other thing, oops. The other thing is, oh, the directional terms, they're actually here. Directional terms help us explain how body parts relate to one another. And so let me go to that thing here. Uh, sorry. There we go. So a few we want to know. Um, what does above mean? What does below mean? So we want to know the terms for that is above means superior, below means inferior. So my nose is inferior to my eyes and my eyes are superior to my nose. That's that stuff. So uh, you cranial and cephalic, cranial means cranium, the head. Cephalic is a different word for head. Those are older, so if you don't get those right now, don't worry about it, just do the first one. The superior you want to know, inferior you want to know. Caudal means tail, because we have a tail. So that's below is the caudet, also that's the word. But inferior is the one that we use in common anatomy and, and, and modern anatomy, I should say, not common, modern anatomy. Then the other one is front and back, anterior and posterior. So my nose is anterior to my ear, my ear is posterior to my nose. That kind of stuff. Ventral, dorsal, you know, don't star them yet. We don't gonna test you on those, but we have like neurology, they use dorsal and ventral, and by then we'll talk about them some more. But I want you to know inferior, I mean anterior and posterior, that's for sure. Those are important. And then the other ones here are lateral and medial. 
Medial is close to the midline, lateral is on the outside. So that's like my nose is medial to my ear, my ear is lateral to my nose. Those are important, medial and lateral. And then proximal and distal relate to the extremities, so where something is attached. If, if it's closer to the attachment side, it's proximal. If it's further away from the attachment side, it's distal. So my finger is distal to my shoulder, or my shoulder is proximal to my finger. And we're going to use those also, but right now you study them and put them on a flashcard and have them in your system, and then they become fine and easy when we use them a little bit. Superficial and deep are self-explanatory, so, but they, we don't use them much. Um, but they are pretty self-explanatory. So when you see them, you know what they mean. Good, that's all the directional terms. And then we're almost finished here, a little couple more. If we take a picture on the inside of the body, such as an MRI or an X-ray, we have to do it in slices since we cannot do it in 3D. We have three main planes that are described. The sagittal plane separates the body into what? Halves. Right and left. Good. So that's the one we definitely want to know. Sagittal is kind of the difficult word here. So sagittal is right and left. Go straight through. So when you see an MRI, an x-ray or an MRI that is like this one down here. Well, it's a little blurry, but that's a spine. The spinal column, and that's the sacrum, that's the butt. They stay like that. Down here you see the sit bone, wherever they are, somewhere down here. But that's a slice like this way, so I can see one half like that. So that's a sagittal slide, a sagittal column, so to speak. Then we also have uh, frontal, and the frontal is nice because it separates the body into a front and into a back. So frontal goes like that, front to back. It's also the coronal, it also uses the word coronal, that's the corona, the crown on top of Jesus. That's, or whoever, more other people too. And then the transverse is top and bottom, goes across. Transverse makes you top and bottom halves. That's pretty much what you need to know for this portion here. Uh, but FYI, this is not heavily uh, worked on the test. I'm working on the, te on the test review. I give you a really good test review. Um, then the last question I have here has to do with the cavities. Boundaries in the body are very are necessary to keep different internal environments separate. For example, the lungs are very different. They're airy, as I said before. Uh, then the gut, which is more liquidy. What does the cranial cavity is enclose? The brain. No, that's too simple. So that goes back to here. So you have a cavity in the chest, the thoracic. Then we have a diaphragm that's right under the, the rib cage. Goes up a little bit. And then underneath we have the abdominal pelvic cavity. That's what we want to talk when we talk core. And then, but see, like, if you have an infectious agent or something, and you got it in here, you want to make sure it stays up there, it doesn't go down here. Same the other way around. That's one reason why we have those things. And you for sure want to make sure that that thing stays out of the cranial cavity, because that thing's enclosed. If you've got inflammation in the brain, meningitis, not good. Because what are you going to do? Where is that going to go? Inflammation is expansion. It's puffy, puffy stuff. And so the... Frontal cavities are the, they see here the word ventral instead of anterior. So the, they use that word here. So you could call that anterior body cavities. That's what I would do if I write the book. And then the dorsal or the posterior body cavity are the yellow ones in the back. So they separate between the gut, the lung stuff, and the brain and spinal cord stuff. And those are the main ones. And let's put it up. All right, if there are any questions, but.